Yeah, uh, uh, Damien uh, reached out to me. He had read a script of mine. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, Whiplash had just been at Sundance, uh, so not many people had seen it. Um, and uh, I was actually looking for a job. My agents sent me on a DVD uh, copy of Whiplash uh, under lock and key. Um, and I watched it with my wife, and we were just blown away uh, at the caliber of the filmmaking. Um, and so I was immediately super excited that Damien had any interest in working with me at all. Uh, and so I, I went and sat down with him, and he pitched me uh, doing a very different take on uh, on a tr you know your traditional space epic, uh, something that was a lot less triumphal and a lot more about the real costs and challenges um, of the of of the space race. Um, and uh, I didn't know much about Neil Armstrong, but I very quickly read Jim Hansen's terrific biography, um, and uh, was really surprised by how much sacrifice uh, Neil and Jan had been through. Um, I didn't know they had lost a child. Uh, I didn't know, uh, you know, the, the year when Neil went up uh, in Gemini 8 and almost died. I, I didn't know anything about Gemini 8, uh, which is just an amazing uh, space story. Um, but I, I also didn't know that he lost two of his closest friends in the program that same year. Um, and, uh, and in fact, one of them had died only two weeks before he went up in Gemini 8. And so uh, I just was, it, my admiration for him only grew. Uh, and my admiration for their family as well and what they'd been through and how hard that must have been. Um, so, uh, so it was a very exciting journey to embark upon uh, with Damien. One thousand feet, switching to lunar mode. Final landing approach. You're too low. Climb. Control is degrading. Slow your rate. Do you read? Neil. What was interesting to me is that our greatest success was built upon failure, right? Our greatest, you know, uh, uh, victory was built upon loss, right? And and uh, and the fact that you know Neil says in the movie, you know, we have to fail that fail down here so we don't fail up there. You know, there's a there's a there's a line. I'm sort of borrowing from, uh, there's a famous line in engineering, uh, in engineering is the obviation of failure. It's about, you know, failing and failing and failing so that then you finally succeed. And that, it, it became very clear that's what the program was, uh, you, know, uh, you know, trial and error and trial and error, um, but with real costs. Uh, and, and, you know, we're used to seeing in movies like this, you know, uh, the men and women just sort of shrugging off the losses and moving on. And we rarely get into the psyche of, 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 of how, um, how hard it is uh, and, uh, and painful. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, NASA sugarcoated things for a reason. Right. They wanted to continue to get funding and they wanted to, you know, uh, they wanted the support of the country. And so it was in their best interest to sugarcoat things. But we wanted to rip that sugarcoating off um, from, from a pretty early point. One of the things I love is the process of working with uh, the, the real people. Uh, so, you know, I was just talking about uh, how I had had the great privilege of working with Don Graham. Uh, uh, pretty intensely uh, on on and Lally Graham uh, on the script for the post because uh, I was really trying to get their mother right. Uh, you know, Liz Han and I were both doing that, and 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 that was a real privilege. Um, on this film, uh, you know, I started with Jim Hansen, who wrote the biography, and then went uh, really deep with uh, Mark and Rick Armstrong. Uh, I spent a good deal of time with Mike Collins. I got to talk to Buzz.
Buzz Aldrin a bit. Um, uh, Buzz is very good with specific questions. His memory is shockingly, uh, I mean, he remembers everything like it was yesterday. Um, uh, beyond, and, and then other folks like Dave Scott and, and uh, who flew in uh, Gemini 8 with Neil, you know, and, and they beat me up pretty good. Uh, you know, I made a lot of errors early on, um, but that's why you have these advisors, you know, why you reach out to anybody who will talk to you because, you know, they, they you know, it's it's a process of, it's an error process, you know, not, not I mean, I'm not going to the moon, but, you know, we f I fail a lot. You know, and and we did hundreds of drafts actually, uh, and 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 I learned a ton actually. Uh, so one thing I did uh, that I've wanted to do for all historical films, uh, but this is the first time I had the wherewithal uh, uh, and the backing to do it was I wrote an annotated screenplay with Jim Hansen, where we literally have the we have the screenplay in here um, uh, with some pictures, but then Jim and I talk about every scene, uh, and we talk about. Uh, we give historical context that you can't give in the movie. Um, uh, sort of where where the f various facts come from and a little more background on them. And then we also talk about where we took license. And I feel a huge responsibility, especially somebody like Neil Armstrong, who's an icon, you know, to get it right. Yeah. And moreover, I wanted to be absolutely transparent about where we're taking license um, because I think a lot of what we're saying about him is provocative um, and true. Uh, and I didn't want that to be obscured by the, you know, couple of little uh, drama, you know, dramatic license, mm -hmm. moments of dramatic license. Um, so, but, it, you know, I, you feel, uh, to me, you feel a huge responsibility to the individual you're portraying. You feel a responsibility to their families if you get to know them. Uh, I felt a huge responsibility to Mark and Rick and Janet. We got to know a little bit. Um, and, and the whole, you know, that whole clan. Uh, and then beyond that, you feel responsibility to the public because for a lot of people, this is what they're going to know about Neil Armstrong. And so you don't want to fill their heads with fake news, as it were. It was probably the most nervous I was was when Mark and Rex saw the film. Um, and, uh, and the fact that they thought we were in the ballpark uh, meant the world. Mark has gone so far as to say, you know, a lot of people ask him what it was like to grow up, you know, you know, the son of Neil Armstrong, and he says now he has an answer, which is the film. Which you know, again, there, there's no higher praise uh, for 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 us, I think. Um, so uh, you know, and and uh, I think I think a lot of folks in the space community uh, uh, were a bit surprised. Um, you know, m most people didn't know Neil had a daughter, even people he knew quite well. Um, and so uh, I think they were, you know, I think there, there are some folks, you know, there was a, uh, one of our um, uh, great helpers, Rob, Robert Perlman, who's a space aficionado, has a website. Um, Robert said when he saw the scene of Neil crying when his daughter dies, uh, he realized he was going to have to totally rethink everything he knew about Neil Armstrong, which to me is a pretty wild statement. And, I mean, it's wild, one, because... You wouldn't think that a father would cry after his daughter dies. Uh, and yet, I think because of the way we blow these people up in our heads, of course you don't think of the icon doing that. But when you actually are looking at the guy, which is what we tried to do. Um, and so I, I think, um, you know, and hopefully, you know, the other thing is hopefully people will be inspired. I, I find, as, as harrowing as this film is at moments, to me, the fact that they still get there uh, it just makes me realize everything great takes sacrifice mm -hmm. um, and it inspires me to work harder and to be willing to sacrifice more for it. We took some small license. Whitey on the Moon came out a couple of years after the landing. Um, it came out, I think, in 71 and 72, but, uh, but we put it in the film because it, it spoke to, you know, this real question of why are we, why are we investing all this energy, effort, you know, uh, why are we sacrificing men, why are we sacrificing money, you know, to go to the moon, right? W why? Why do all of this? And, um, and especially when we have real problems right here on Earth uh, that need to be uh, tackled. Uh, you know, we have Kurt Vonnegut say something, and, you know, and, and, and we really wanted that perspective in there because it's, it's a legitimate question um, and, and one that was being asked. Uh, 
uh, uh, much more than people remember. Uh, you know, I mean, the support for the program was was you know over fifty percent of Americans thought it wasn't worth it. Uh, by the time right leading up to the moon, and then that dropped a bit once they got to the moon. I don't know what space exploration will uncover, but I don't think it'll be exploration just for the sake of exploration. I think it'll be more the fact that it allows us to see things that maybe we should have seen a long time ago, but just haven't been able to until now. You're always going to have that question with exploration, I think, because you don't know what you're going to see. You know, Neil talks about this in the movie. He says, you know, you're not quite sure what you're going to get when you get there. You know, a lot of the great work in uh, climate science, right, uh, that has shown, despite what, peop what, what some foolish politicians say, has shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that, you know, climate change is a major issue. Uh, and is rapidly affecting the planet. A lot of that is because of NASA, because uh, of the, uh, the Goddard Institute, which you know, you know, by going up, you know, in space, we've been able to observe the planet in ways that we weren't able to before, uh, and we've had the foresight to do that and to track all sorts of things. Um, uh, you know, and, 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 and uh, Rory Kennedy wrote this, uh, has this brilliant documentary, which is going to be on Discovery, uh, about this, about 60 years of NASA, and, and it really pushes towards, towards, you know, the great work that they've done. And so, you know, uh, it, it, those are tools that hopefully we will soon be smart enough to, you know, use and, you know, push, push against, uh, uh, try, try to start pushing the tide back back on that uh, and, 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 and reversing, uh, reversing, you know, the course of global warming. But, you know, but the, uh, the, that's, again, that's one of those things that they didn't know when they were trying to, you know, go to the moon, that that might be something that would come out of this effort. We spent a lot of time with the boys uh, and we had them read several drafts of the script um, uh, and we got a lot of notes on those scenes, but you know w what we w what was very important to us was that uh, again the you know uh, where did we get the idea that Janet pushed Neil to sit and talk to the boys about that he might not come back? We got that from Janet, like that uh, that scene that argument. I'm not sure it got that hot, uh, and it certainly didn't have all those words. Um, but the kernel of that idea comes from Janet talking to Jim Hansen and saying, I wanted him to talk to the boys because I lost my father when I was 15 and I wanted him to talk to the boys about that they might lose theirs. So, you know, we got that from Janet. And then the actual scene of the boys sitting down uh, to talk to Neil, you know, we got, you know, there's all sorts of stuff we got from the boys. Uh, there's, uh, you know, I had originally said it in the bedroom, and Rick was like, no, 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 it was in the dining room. And I remember because it, it was weird because we never went to the dining room to have a talk, right? So we never used the dining room. Like once a year we use the dining room. So, um, you know, so we said it in the dining room. And, you know, and, and the, uh, the actual, some of the language, uh, specifically the language Neil uses where he talks about... Uh, you know, there are risks, but we have every reason to believe we'll make it back, you know, in this very sort of clinical way, that came from Rick. You know, I said, you know, I'd written something that wasn't very good, and, and I said to Rick, so what would he have said? And Rick rattled that off uh, and said, I, I think he said something like this. And so I used verbatim what Rick had told me. Uh, now, as Rick remembers it, it's the first thing Neil said when they sat down as opposed to being prompted by a question and Rick didn't ask that question so we take some license there but again we're basing the scene in you know what we know to be true uh, and so hopefully that makes it feel you know have a level of verisimilitude, verisimilitude. Um, I think the other thing Damien did, which is, is really, uh, I, I think, extraordinary, is he had Claire and Ryan uh, spend two weeks 
right before we started shooting, it was two weeks of rehearsal where it was bas basically just play with the kids. Uh, and just to get them in the in the flow of what it would be, and, and he shot a lot of that, and some of it wound up in the movie. Um, it, you know, uh, there are various moments that are improvised throughout the movie, which again I think gives it an organic feel. But but more than that, uh, the having them just sit together and play together and be a family for a couple weeks, uh, I think you feel that then throughout the. Piece. You you feel the there's a there's a intimacy there that um, that I think might not have been without that without those couple weeks. This movie is so much about trying to show you what you didn't see, what you don't know, right? I mean, there's a tremendous challenge with this film when you're taking it on that everyone knows the ending, right? So how are you going to get them to go to the theaters when everyone knows the ending? But there's so much you don't know, right, about Neil's story, and so I was so averse to the things that everyone knows that in my first draft I didn't write the line I just I was like I want to all, all I really want to do is be with him emotionally and and feel what that feels like the 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 oddness of it all uh and then feel that release of wandering over you know the one unscripted moment uh, that wasn't in the mission plan, you know, when he wanders over to, to, to Little West Crater uh, and seeing what happens there. Um, and, and that was my entire focus. And Damien convinced me, uh, he said, I, I want to hear the line because I want to I wanna be, if we do this right, we will, we will hear that line in a different way. Um, and certainly, you know, when Damien started, you know, I think, one of my favorite shots in the movie is the POV shot where he looks down at his boot, right? Where you're literally in his, you know, point of view, looking down at the boot on the moon, and and it's just so odd. Just the just the emotions that must have rushed, you know, in that moment of achieving this thing that your entire team of four hundred thousand people has been working on for a decade you know not quite a decade actually only you know seven seven eight years but you know but they've been working on very hard where you'd lost friends along the way where you'd had to be so focused and shut yourself off from your family in order to you know in order to get there um you know and then to have that it must have been over overwhelming uh and it, what's amazing what was amazing to me is the first time i saw the film Put together, I, I felt overwhelmed, which was which was what we were trying to do. Brian, Neil, if it does turn out, you'll go down in history. What kind of thoughts do you have about that when the thought hits you? Uh, gosh, suppose that flight successful. We're planning on that flight being successful. Uh, I, I just meant how you feel about being a part of history. I think I can shed some light here. It's a responsibility, but. It's exciting to be the first. Even my wife is excited. She keeps slipping jewelry into my PPK. <laughs> You're planning on taking some of her jewelry to the moon, Buzz? Sure. What, what fella wouldn't want to give his wife bragging rights? <laughs> Neil, will you take anything? Uh, if I had a choice, I'd take more fuel. Jim says repeatedly throughout the book that Neil was emotionally very tightly packaged. Um, he was not, and you know, Janet in in her interview with Jim would say things like, "He's not one to share." Like he he is he was very very close to the vest emotionally, and so it, it you know, and and it's a pretty non traditional character arc because you start with a guy who's somewhat closed off he opens up a little as he joins Gemini and gets to know some of those guys and then he just suffers blow after blow you know and and closes off again uh, and and goes even more closed off than he was right after Karen died and um, and so it, it's 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 challenging but it was all towards the release it was all towards that moment at the end you know that bracelet moment you know it, you know this is a guy who's running you know and and running from grief um, uh, you know, Ryan said it beautifully that, you know, uh, this isn't about a guy trying to land on the moon, it's about a guy trying to land on Earth. He's trying to deal, figure out how, where to put those feelings. And, and so that moment on the moon is, is the moment where he finally has, you know, this, he's gone as far as he could. 
um, you know, uh, Damien talks about the Orpheus myth, right? He, he's gone, you know, to, to, to Hades, you know, and, and can't bring her back. And so he's got to leave her there. Uh, so it's, it's uh, speculation, but it's not, it's not my conjecture. Uh, it's actually Jim Hansen's conjecture. So Jim, in his biography, uh, I mean, Jim spent like 60 hours talking to Neil, which, I mean, most interviewers got, you know, 20 minutes. So, you know, 60 hours was a lot of time. Uh, and, and he also then did a huge 360. I mean, he, you know, spoke to the boys. He spoke to Janet. He spoke to June, Neil's sister. You know, he spoke to all of Neil's colle colleagues. I mean, he really went very deep. In doing that research, he started to wonder um, if Neil might have brought something to the moon. Uh, it was done. Uh, you know, uh, Charlie Duke left a picture of his family on the moon. Uh, Neil and Buzz actually left a pouch with an Apollo 1 patch uh, for the guys who had passed, as well as two medallions for the two Russians uh, who, had, who, had, who had died, uh, two cosmonauts who had died. So it wasn't like it, this wasn't something that was done. Um, you know, uh, and so Jim started to speculate. Um, and he asked Neil for the manifest for his personal property kit where he would have taken something. And Neil claimed to have lost it. It's since been found. It's under seal at Purdue University uh, and will be under seal, I think, for another five, five years or so. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, that was, I guess, suspicious to Jim. And so he went and he asked June, Neil's sister, um, if she thought Neil might have brought something of Karen's to the moon. And she said, oh, I dearly hope so. Uh, and so that was enough for Jim. And so Jim wrote about that in his book. And so, you know, uh, we, we debated it, but we basically decided if it was good enough for June and good enough for Jim, it was good enough for us. For me, uh, my father passed away um, uh, not long before I started working on this. Um, and uh, someone sent me a quote by Samuel Beckett about, you know, uh, how extraordinary it is that we managed to continue to move on with our wounds um, and uh, and that's you know I think when you lose someone who's close to you you know you know you join it's the first time I really felt like I had grown up um, and uh, and was now an adult because I knew you know knew what that was about and uh, and in some ways that's what this movie is about again with the character we, we tried to you know, we took that tough road with that very, you know, it, it, it's, the movie is relentless as his life was relentless in, in that moment. And you only get the release on the moon. And then thank God you have Claire Foy, right? Because you write all sorts of stuff for Janet and you hope you're going to get an actor like Claire who's going to be able to emote in, in the way that you need so that you can keep, keep the audience on board. And she's extraordinary. No, you don't. All these protocols and procedures to make it seem like you have it under control. But you're a bunch of boys making models out of balsa wood. You don't have anything under control. You know, th that, that hopefully tethers us emotionally to him when, when he becomes so closed off. And, and, you know, and also thank God for Ryan because, you know, he works so well in the small and can communicate so much. But, um, but it definitely was a, 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 you know, it was a bold choice. Uh, and trying to tackle Neil was, was challenging for that reason. You know, uh, we had several endings we played with. And actually that ending was, that, that scene was always in the film, always scripted. But we actually had a scripted ending that went beyond that. And there was, at some point in the middle of filming, uh, Damien and I turned to each other. And, and the relationship was so strong between Janet and Neil. Um, in the work that Claire and Ryan were doing and and it really was clearly a movie about that relationship uh, and so we literally turned to each other and were like maybe this is where we end the film and what I love about that scene because you can write anything you want on the page but ultimately it's up to the actors and you know we we basically wrote the scene wordless uh, you know if you look at the the scene in here you, you'd see like um, it's not it's not like two lines right you, you script out like the emotional transaction of the scene what what you think is happening right um I'll find it here right so you know so you, know, you script out 
you know, I've got a good half page of script, like trying to beat out what's going on. Um, uh, but really, it's up to the actors. And and what I love, uh, you know, what I love about the scene is it, it's a re they have a whole conversation, right, uh, with just their eyes and their looks. Um, and and what I love about the scene is it's it's hopeful that after s this couple has. We know they love each other, but we know they've just, just sustained blow after blow after blow after blow. Um, you know, starting with Karen and then, you know, Ed and Elliot and Pat and the job, and it's been so hard, and yet they still reach for each other, right? And so, you know, I, I can't think of many more hopeful things than that. <laughs>